Do you think this is a story about a harlot? Asked Emily Davis as a group of Perriman financial execs sat around a bar at Logan International Airport in Boston, waiting out a snow delay. How about this? I know a woman so conniving that she flew to Norway once a year for the company's annual meetings and spent most of the week on her back with the CEO's son between her legs. She did this for like 20 years, and her husband never suspected a thing. In the office, she was prime and proper, and for 51 weeks of the year, you would have thought she was the nicest, most conservative, quiet woman you'd ever met. But she'd go to Norway for corporate meetings once a year. She didn't think the rest of us knew what was going on, but come on, woman, when you leave the hotel every night with the same guy, and don't sneak back to your hotel room until time to shower and change for the next day's meetings. Nobody's stupid well, except maybe her husband, but I guess you can't really fault him. Why would he think his practically goody two-shoes wife would be whoring around for one week a year? I worked with that woman for like 15 years. I left about two years ago. I wonder if she's still sleeping with him. What was her name? Olivia? Olivia Brown. Yeah, that's it. I bet that poor guy's going to go to his grave, never knowing that his wife was cheating on him. Hey, wait a minute. We have a guy in our group named Brown, Matthew Jackson whispered to me. You don't think she's talking about Brown's wife, do you, Joshua? You've met her. She does kind of come off like an ice queen, but she's one hot mile. That's the story, David, as close as I can remember it, Joshua Moore said to me over the phone. They went on to talk about somebody else hooking up after that, but I knew I had to call you as soon as I heard it. I hope it's not your Olivia, David. Jesus, I really do. But if it were my wife, I'd want to be told. Thanks, Joshua. Really? I mean it. I hope it's not her too, I said to my coworker. Hey, could you do me a favor and not mention this to anyone else? If Matthew brings it up again, just cool the story down as quietly as you can, and I'll tell Matthew myself if I have to, but only if I have to. I've worked with Joshua for 15 years at Paramin, and I trust the man with the lives of my children, so I knew he could keep this quiet. I also trusted that he got the story straight, which means I had a world-flipping problem. My wife, Olivia, holds a management position at Johansson Lutt, a financial services firm based in Norway. For the past 23 years, she's been flying to Norway for a week of corporate meetings as part of the management team. Olivia is conservative, prim, and proper, yet undeniably attractive. But my Olivia would never cheat on me, could she? Emily Davis's words echoed in my mind. I bet that poor bastard's going to go to his grave, never knowing that his wife was cuckold in him. Sitting idly and hoping it wasn't true wasn't an option. This poor bastard was going to find out the truth. Olivia and I have been married for 25 years. We met in college and dated for three years before tying the knot. We both work in the financial services sector and have achieved considerable success in our careers. We have three wonderful children, one who has graduated college, one who is a junior, and the youngest who is a freshman. With all the kids off to college, we've become empty nesters this year. Although it took some adjusting, being alone together again seemed to rekindle our already good marriage, or so I thought until a few minutes ago. I sat at my office desk, contemplating the situation. I genuinely didn't know where to start. Olivia had begun her career at Johansson right out of college, about a year before we got married. It took her three years to earn her place at the corporate meetings in Norway, and she's been attending every year since. She doesn't usually have much to say about the meetings either before or after. They just appear to be a necessary evil. Reflecting back, she did seem somewhat distressed about going while pregnant with our first child, but I assumed it was because she was five months along and beginning to feel uncomfortable. Now, of course, I'm questioning whether she was upset because she was pregnant while seeing her lover. I went through my Firefox favorites and clicked on Johansson's website. It was a beautiful, fast-loading site, befitting one of the world's top financial firms. Since it was Olivia's company, I would occasionally browse it, but until today, the only corporate officer I knew was the CEO, Ryan Martinez. Martinez had brought three of his family members into the company, two sons and a daughter, and I found their photos and biographies on the website, along with several other top officers. I read the kids' bios in chronological order, so I got to James Martinez last. 
When I opened his bio and saw a photo larger than a postage stamp, I almost lost my lunch. I was staring at the faces of my two youngest children, William and Sophia. Holy shit. Olivia is of Norwegian descent, with long blonde hair and sparkling blue eyes, so I never thought twice about our last two kids being blonde and blue-eyed, just as I never questioned when Emma came out with brown hair and eyes like mine. But after seeing James Martinez's photo, there was no way those kids could be mine. I quickly did the math. The corporate meet is usually in August, and both of their birthdays are in May. No way. I desperately needed to talk to someone, but who could I really trust with such a delicate secret, and who had the strength of character to advise me well? Besides Olivia, my go-to in situations like this was my father-in-law, Benjamin Clark. He had been my most trusted advisor since my dad passed when I was in my late twenties. He was a solid guy, never imposing himself in any situation, which made him my life consiglier during the few times I needed to talk to someone other than my wife. But I couldn't go to Benjamin. How do you hurt a guy by saying, Excuse me, sir, but I think your daughter has been sleeping with someone behind my back for over 20 years. It quickly became clear to me that I don't have many close, personal friends when I assessed the situation. My next closest advisor was my favorite bartender, the night manager at a small bar near my house called simply My Place. It was an old-fashioned pub that I sometimes visited for a quick drink or two, or took Olivia for a quick dinner on other nights. Over the years, I had become somewhat close friends with Grace, the feisty but level-headed daughter of the owner. She was a few years younger than me, but had worked at the pub her entire working life, and as such, had developed a real knack for understanding people. She had given me her thoughts and advice on a number of subjects over the years, but nothing of this magnitude. I hope she was up to this challenge, although I wasn't sure if I was. I took a couple of personal hours off work and headed over to my place. I got there about an hour before Grace came on. I sat at the bar, just shooting the breeze with her father, Jacob, while I put down a pair of JDs over ice. Since I rarely got to the bar this early, I hadn't spoken to Jacob in a while because he usually headed home as soon as possible after his shift was up. That's how you stay married to the same woman for 50 years, he would often brag. How's that pretty wife of yours, David? Jacob inquired. Being lost in deep thought, I guess I didn't hear the question, so Jacob repeated it from just a few feet away, louder this time. I heard him then, and I think most of the bar did too. I stammered, honestly unsure how to answer what should have been a simple question. She's fine, Dad. Sheesh. Grace answered for me, appearing from my left and having just entered through the employee entrance. Hey babe, how are you? I asked as I locked her in a friendly bear hug. She hugged me back firmly and whispered in my ear, I'm fine, but I'm sensing all is not well in David Land, is it? I pulled back from the hug with a shocked look on my face. How could she possibly know? I thought to myself. Seeing my expression, Grace sat down on the stool next to me and quietly asked, It's Olivia, isn't it? What's going on, Brown? I haven't confirmed anything yet, and it will take time, but I have learned from a very good source that she cheated on me behind my back for over 20 years. What? How the hell could you not know something like this has been happening for all these years? She said in shock. Because she only does it one week a year, when she goes to Norway for her company's corporate meetings. Apparently, if she's been cheating with the boss's son for the last 25 years, one week a year. Ooh, she replied. Exactly, I answered. Well, you can't just do nothing unless you're one of those perverts who likes their wife to sleep with other men, she said, waiting for a reaction. I gave her a pissed look, which should have told her everything she needed to know, and she continued on. Girls all over the world would have you ask yourself if you'd be better off with or without her, but it's not like that in the real world, David, she began. If you're the man I think you are, there's no way you can live with the cheating whore who breaks her vows, even though you may not have known it for a long time, and it only happens one week a year while she's out of the country. I don't think you could live with yourself giving her this kind of hall pass, and that's the rub. You might have loved her more than life itself, maybe you still do, but what kind of life will you have by throwing away your self-respect? Wrong is still wrong. 
Then there's also the matter of the younger two kids being his as well, I interrupted. Grace looked like somebody had knocked the wind out of her. She looked every bit the way I'd felt when Joshua told me what he'd heard. I filled in the speechless gap while she sat there in shock. That's not yet been confirmed, I said. I was thinking of giving all three kids ancestry DNA kits for Christmas to find out in about two months. No. No, that's the wrong way to go about this, she replied. If you do that, everyone will realize the secret, and then you've probably ruined any chance for revenge. The R word. That's why I went to Grace. Like me, she wouldn't take this line down. I didn't need a marriage counselor. I needed someone to consider my side of the situation. You need to keep this completely secret until you are ready to make a move. But if what you're telling me is true, you might still lose those kids, and I know that would tear your heart out. So whatever you do, and I'm not sure there's much you can do, it has to balance with your desire to remain the father to those two kids. She then quickly changed the subject. How about during Christmas break you bring everyone here for a quick meal? I'll personally serve drinks to everyone and make sure I remove the old glasses from the table and put them into a sealed container. Then we, you can take the containers to a DNA testing place I know. We'll get DNA from all five of you, which is a better and more accurate way in the long run. And at least I get the price of a meal out of your sorry self. She smiled broadly as she delivered the jab, but it helped lighten the mood a bit. Plus, she had given me sound advice. This was going to be a marathon, not a sprint. What are you going to do about intimacy? She asked, quickly changing the subject again. Was she asking me what I thought she was asking me? No, because she immediately broke into a devilish smile and said, Ah, ah, ah. Don't even think you heard that right, moron. I'm not asking if you want to make love, asshole. I'm asking what you're going to do about Olivia wanting to make love to you like usual. You can't just stop, because then she'll know something is wrong. Damn, you're good at this stuff. I hope for Michael's sake he never gets on your bad side. I replied, referencing her husband of about 25 years. I hadn't thought about that at all. Good point. I guess, for appearance's sake, I'll have to keep making love to her three times a week. But maybe to teach her a subtle lesson, I won't use my tongue anymore. Let me repeat, idiot, she stated flatly. You've got to do whatever you normally do with her until you're ready to act. She's not a stupid woman. In fact, she's deceived you quite nicely for 20-some years. So, in other words, you're telling me I need to leave the gun, take the cannoli for now. Exactly. Nice Godfather reference, too. Play it cool. Don't rush. Of course, that was going to be easier said than done. You can't just unlove somebody overnight, no matter how badly they've hurt you, but this betrayal stung like hydrogen peroxide on an open wound. I guess I was a little quieter during the Christmas season than usual, and Olivia's folks picked up on it. Luckily for me, they didn't go to Olivia for answers. Because of our great relationship, they came straight to me and asked if something was on my mind or if I was sick. I felt terrible having to lie to them. I'm going to miss the kids when Olivia and I get divorced. I wonder if I can get custody of them. It was sad for me, knowing this was going to be our last Christmas together as a family. I watched the kids do something stupid together, and it took me back to when they were little. Back then, I didn't know these kids weren't mine, and I still thought I was the luckiest man in the world to have an intelligent and beautiful woman as a wife. I wondered if she'd run to Martinez after the divorce. I knew he was married, but would he trade in his wife for my ex, or would she become his full-time mistress? What would my kids do when they found out? Would I still be dad? Or would I just be dad? So many questions, so few answers. Three weeks after Christmas, I had my DNA results, which confirmed what I already knew. Emma was the child of both Olivia and me, and William and Sophia were the children of Olivia and an as yet unnamed dickhead, who I assumed to be James Martinez. Olivia had a girls' night out the following Thursday after I got the DNA results, so I took that opportunity to see Grace at my place. I gave her the results to review, and she handed me a file of several divorce attorneys she had researched for me. You're not going to get screwed by the courts on this divorce, Grace told me. Your kids are almost out of the house. 
Your home is now community property and will be part of the 50-50th settlement. So, your only concern should be what you want to do in terms of revenge. And whatever you do, don't go so over the top that you drive the kids away. Considering everything, it seemed the best way for me to get revenge was financially. First, I had to file for divorce. After that, I planned to sue Johansson for not enforcing its morals contract, which led to my divorce. Next, I intended to sue Martinez for child support. The last piece was contingent upon when my two younger kids found out he was their father. Sooner or later, they would, and I wanted him to pay through the nose if possible. Not that I planned to keep that money. I was actually going to divide the settlement into three equal pieces and start a trust fund for all my kids. I contacted one of the attorneys Grace scoped out for me and got things started. I almost blew everything a few months later. Our 26th anniversary was on March 23, and I took the whole family and Olivia's folks to one of the best restaurants in town, Pasqualums, for a sumptuous meal. I was watching Olivia accessorize with jewelry as we were getting ready to go out, and I noticed a small velour bag tucked into the corner of the bottom layer of her jewelry box. Over the years, I've bought Olivia a lot of nice jewelry, and I didn't recall anything coming in a velour bag. I absent-mindedly reached for the bag, opened the drawstring, and pulled out what appeared to be two very expensive gold bracelets with numerous turquoise charms attached to them. Being a financial guy, I was able to eyeball them long enough to see that one bracelet had a dozen charms, and the other had eleven. Wow, when did you get these? I asked before I could really think about it. Olivia looked over, flushed deep red, and quickly took them from my hands. These old things, she stammered. Ah, that's just some trinkets I picked up in Norway about a hundred years ago. She didn't look me in the eyes as she said it, and quickly put them back in the bag and back in the jewelry box. That's when it hit me. Those were probably gifts from Martinez, with a charm being added every year to mark their week together. She probably brings them with her to Norway and wears them for him. That kind of set Olivia on edge for the rest of the evening. I know the kids noticed it, and I think all three kids sensed something was wrong. Olivia's trip to Norway was planned for August 14 to 21. She was her usual composed self, and knowing what I know now, I marvel at her acting skills. In the weeks leading up to the trip, she appeared unchanged. If I hadn't known that the children weren't mine, I would have thought the whole story was made up. She even gave me our usual goodbye kiss on the lips before heading to the airport in the company limo on Sunday morning. My flight to Oslo, Norway, was scheduled for later in the day. I had arranged a full week of vacation without informing Olivia, my kids, or my in-laws. Some things you just have to witness for yourself, I told Grace when discussing my plans. I arrived late Sunday night, picked up my rental car, and drove to my hotel, conveniently located a few blocks from where Johansson was conducting corporate meetings and where the Johansson out-of-towners were staying. On Monday afternoon, I did a bit of sightseeing. Oslo is undeniably a beautiful city. Based on the itinerary Olivia showed me, the meetings were set to conclude by 4 p.m. each day, with dinner scheduled at 6 p.m. with some local Johansson representatives. Any of the American attendees could opt out to explore the city and dine on their own. The meetings would officially end by noon on Friday, leaving the Americans about a day and a half to tour the city. I began loitering near the hotel around 4 p.m., aware that it would take Olivia some time to change into a casual outfit. I donned sunglasses and wore a fake beard, confident that Olivia would never recognize me, as she would never expect to see me in Norway. She emerged from the hotel in a chic, shorter-than-usual little black dress that I had never seen before. The dress plunged to the middle of her 36 to breasts, accentuating her stunning figure. She wore three-inch CFM black heels and sported a bracelet on each wrist. These bracelets, once called old trinkets in her jewelry box, were anything but. I wasn't foolish. Those trinkets were likely worth around $5,000 each. She got into a company limousine. I couldn't see if that jerk was already in the vehicle, but when they arrived at the restaurant, he exited first and then helped her out. She leaned in and gave him a passionate kiss on the lips before they headed inside. I stayed back, 
eating a couple of yogurts while I waited for them to reappear, which happened about two hours later. They got back in the car and then drove to another hotel, probably where the jerk was staying. I had no idea if his wife was at home or not, but at least he wasn't risking bringing Olivia to his own place. I spent an incredibly boring night in the rental car, watching several movies on my iPad. At 5.56 a.m., Olivia came out of the hotel, clearly not as fresh as she looked the night before, and got into the limousine. The jerk didn't accompany her. They drove back to the first hotel, and she went inside. That gave her time to shower and change before the meetings resumed at 9 a.m. I returned to my hotel and managed to get a few hours of restless sleep. Seeing her with him broke my heart and made me furious. To think she had been doing this to me for 24 years. I followed her to his hotel on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights, spending each evening watching movies from my car until she emerged and returned to her hotel. By Friday, I was both exhausted and completely enraged. The meetings ended at noon, and by 1.30, Olivia was dressed more casually as she got into the company limousine. Unlike the previous days when only a few of Olivia's co-workers were around, this time a large group was gathered at the front of the hotel when she got into the limo. A few heads turned, but nobody seemed particularly shocked to see Olivia getting into the company limo with a suitcase by herself. Either they assumed it was all business, or she had been doing this for so long that no one paid much attention anymore. I followed them to several sites on Friday and Saturday. Just sat in my car, drank coffee, and ate yogurt. I tried some of the local fast food joints in the area, but preferred the yogurt. My clothes were rumpled and wrinkled, and I was tired and grumpy. I kind of felt like that old TV detective Columbo. It was a great way to slowly let my love for Olivia fade away. Saturday night, they got in the limo and went to an out-of-the-way, upscale restaurant. Since Olivia was leaving the next day, I figured this was their celebratory last night dinner for the year. It was almost time to take action. I figured a man like Martinez had a reservation, and they'd be seated immediately when they arrived, so I waited about 30 minutes before getting out of the car and heading into the restaurant, figuring they would be eating their main course by then. During the night, I had checked into a nearby hotel to shower and shave. While waiting for the 30 minutes to elapse, I changed into a suit and tie I had brought for the occasion. I stopped at the reservation table, showed them a photo of my wife, and said I needed to be taken to her table. The maitre did looked at me in my suit, noticed the large manila envelope in my hand, and escorted me to Martinez's table. When we stopped in front of the table, both of them looked up. It took Olivia about five seconds to realize she was looking at me, her husband, and then she burst into tears. Martinez sat there with a quizzical, concerned look on his face. Just for the record, here you go, Olivia, I said, placing the envelope next to her plate. Quickly, I pulled out my cell phone and snapped several photos of her, Martinez, and the envelope. With a simple touch, those photos were sent to my attorney, my three kids, Olivia's parents, and Grace. By the way, nice trinkets. I'm guessing you've got 24 charms now. I turned on my heel and left. I heard a lot of commotion and Norwegian being spoken behind me. Didn't care. Turned off my phone too. I drove back to my original hotel and had the best night's sleep I'd had in weeks. My flight from Oslo home was at 7 a.m. local time, so I checked out of the hotel around 4, returned the rental car, and was at the airport by 5. About 12 hours later, I was back in my Lazy Boy in Dallas. Olivia's flight wasn't scheduled to arrive for another three hours, and if my guess was right, she would likely head to her parents' house for some comfort instead of coming home late. As I put my feet up, I turned my phone back on. Apparently, I had stirred up quite a commotion. To be precise, Olivia had caused the chaos. I was merely the messenger. There were 23 voice messages and 16 texts waiting when everything loaded. Nine of the messages and six of the texts were from Olivia. I didn't listen to any of the messages nor respond to any texts. I took my time leisurely downing my Jack Daniels Tennessee honey over ice. Once I finished, I called Benjamin. Out of everyone I sent the photos to, I felt the worst about sending them to him. He deserved better but I knew he wouldn't believe me without seeing the photo. Dad, I'm sorry, 
were the first words out of my mouth as soon as he picked up. I know that was a harsh way to find out, but there was no good way to tell you. He didn't say anything for about 10 seconds, and I thought he was going to hang up when I heard a sniffle on the other end of the line. He was crying. I understand, David, he said. And it's me that owes you the apology. I thought I raised my daughter better than that. I know this probably sounds stupid, but I hope we can remain family after this all plays out between you and my daughter. You've been such a big part of our lives. I heard him crying. He gently hung up the phone. Next, I did a conference call with my three kids. I always knew my kids were smart, but I still wasn't prepared for the opening salvo, which came from the youngest, Sophia. We're not your kids, William and I, she asked through her sobs. Baby, you're all still my kids, right up until the moment one of you three nutballs decides you're not. Who sat up with you when you were sick? Who taught you long division? Who coached your baseball and soccer teams? We all cried a lot during that phone call, but when we hung up, I think the kids realized I wasn't going anywhere, and our relationship didn't have to change one bit. I did tell them about my plan to make Martinez pay up, and how I was going to split that three ways. Interestingly, we only briefly talked about Olivia and me, and the one thing I gathered from that conversation was that the kids didn't know any more about the affair than I did. At least, that was something. Olivia never returned home that night. My assumption that she would go to her parents was confirmed when Benjamin called around 10 p.m. and suggested we meet on Monday. I had already informed my boss about some personal matters I needed to attend to, and I didn't think Olivia would go to work, so we scheduled the meeting at 2 p.m. at her home, at least for now. Olivia and her parents arrived separately around 2 p.m., indicating that Olivia planned to stay the night. I offered Benjamin and Lily drinks. Benjamin and I had Tennessee honey, while Lily opted for Diet 7-Up. Olivia did not want a drink. I didn't offer her one, just as I didn't greet her with a kiss or a hug. We all sat in the living room, with Benjamin and I in chairs across from the sofa where Olivia and Lily sat. There was an awkward moment of silence as we took sips of our drinks before Olivia spoke tentatively. Did you really have to come all the way to Oslo to give me the papers? If you already knew, why didn't you just have me served here? She asked. I had expected an apology, so her question didn't impress me. I needed to confirm for myself that what I discovered was true. For 24 years, the one I thought was my soulmate had an affair once a year, I replied. Don't use that language, dear, Lily interrupted. Yes, mom, I will. And by coming here with the delegation, you exposed yourself to uncomfortable truths. I love you and dad like my own parents, but even if they were here, I wouldn't hold back. Delicacy left the moment your daughter cheated on me and acted as if nothing happened, I said sternly. Have I ever given you a reason to betray my trust during our marriage? I questioned Olivia, turning to face her. I noticed Benjamin frowning and signaling Lily to remain silent as I focused on Olivia. It seemed like I wouldn't face any more interruptions from her. I glared at my wife, who squirmed uncomfortably on the sofa. No, David, you never gave me a reason to betray you like I did. I am deeply sorry, Olivia replied. Then why did you continue for so long? If you wanted Martinez, why didn't you just tell me? But instead, you made a fool out of me for 24 years. I trailed off in anger. I don't want James. I want you, David. You are the one I want to spend my life with, the father of my children, Olivia began. Stop right there, I yelled. Two of them aren't my children, not biologically. How dare you? You betray me and have two children with him, rubbing it in my face. You have a twisted way of showing love, I continued, seething with anger. Olivia seemed surprised that I knew about William and Sophia's paternity, as she had not spoken to the children recently. Additionally, she apparently had not informed her parents, as both looked shocked. I thought I heard Lily beginning to cry, but I kept my focus on Olivia. You not only betray me, but also disrespect me by having me raise another man's children, I accused. Just so you know, the kids already know. I didn't tell them, they realized it from a photo, like I did. I simply confirmed their suspicions, I stated. Olivia lowered her head, hiding her expression from me but muttering, Oh no, oh no. 
As Olivia continued muttering to herself, I took the chance to signal Benjamin for a refill, which he acknowledged with a nod. His expression betrayed a sense of devastation. Upon returning with the drinks, Olivia appeared more composed and immediately began pleading her case. Sweetie, we can move past this. James was just a fleeting indulgence, once a year far away. I never took any love away from you for him, and if you hadn't found out, you would have believed I was your soulmate, which I am. Can't we go back to that? She implored. Are you taking me for a fool? I responded sharply. Some things can't be undone or unseen. Your choices have shattered us. Benjamin, would you forgive Laylee if she had done to you what Olivia did to me? Honestly, David, I wouldn't, Benjamin admitted. There you have it, Olivia. That's not an option, I stated firmly. Perhaps one day I can overcome the love I had for you, but I don't know if I can ever overcome the hate. I need to excuse myself now. I'll find solace in a bar where I respect it. Olivia, you should gather your things and stay with your parents. You won't be staying here, I directed. Benjamin Lilly, my apologies for the abruptness. You know I care for you, I added, concluding the discussion. I didn't need to hear more lies. Gathering my car keys and phone, I made my way to my place. Olivia resisted the divorce, prompting me to leverage a morals clause against Johansson for their role in the demise of our marriage. Three days later, a remorseful Olivia agreed to sign the divorce papers, having been terminated from her job for cause, jeopardizing her prospects for another high-end position. I understand, David. There's no need to further ruin my life, she conceded. Fortunately, karma quickly took care of that for me. After letting go of Olivia, Johansson also had to dismiss James, causing quite a stir in the industry. It was uncommon for the son of a prominent financial services firm CEO to be fired by his own father's company, especially for engaging in an affair with a subordinate. Mrs. James Martinez was evidently displeased with the scandal, threatening her social standing. Unaware of her husband's other relationships, she reportedly reacted furiously when the news broke, causing damage to their luxurious home in Oslo before filing for divorce. With his termination, pending divorce, and the tabloid frenzy across Europe, Martinez became a noteworthy figure in the news. Reports surfaced that he had been involved with a Johansson employee from the London office during corporate meetings for a week annually. Despite knowing about his marital status, she took issue with Martinez's multiple affairs. In the midst of the scandal, Martinez's wife sought child support reimbursement, leading to additional claims from two other women in Germany and Poland. Media outlets eagerly covered the story, revealing Martinez's infidelities and the fallout with his enraged wife. Olivia was just one of many women involved with Martinez, resulting in a significant number of children outside his marriage. Attempting to deflect blame, the unfaithful Martinez sued Johansson for harassment, alleging that a company executive had coerced her into a relationship. However, a Norwegian court dismissed his claims, pointing to the existence of two children from their affair and the consensual nature of their involvement. The scandal of female infidelity, divorces, and children from extramarital affairs involving betrayed husbands caught the attention of the American press. Newspapers and magazines sensationalized the story, resulting in unwanted attention and furtive glances for everyone involved. Uncomfortable with the public scrutiny, I withdrew from social activities and became somewhat of a hermit for about three months, only venturing out for essential errands. Initially, the children seemed to handle the situation well, likely due to their familiarity with the digital age's lack of privacy. However, two weeks later, Sophia tearfully reached out to me, struggling to come to terms with her mother's infidelity becoming public knowledge. I reassured her that it was her mother's issue to deal with, not hers, and she shouldn't feel responsible or apologize for her mother's actions. The fact that Sophia turned to me for comfort and guidance during this difficult time was a silver lining amidst the turmoil. Meanwhile, Benjamin shared that Olivia had become a recluse rarely leaving his home and facing social backlash for her actions on social media. Following Olivia's agreement to the divorce, we divided our assets evenly. In the absence of Olivia's income, I covered the remaining college expenses for William and Sophia, funded by a substantial payout from James Martinez.
I distributed the remainder of the funds among our children, securing a significant settlement from Johansson to resolve my legal dispute with them out of court. This allowed me to invest in a new home in a vibrant neighborhood in Dallas, using a portion of the settlement and proceeds from the sale of our house. While I contemplated relocating to another city to escape the judgment and whispers, a heartfelt conversation with Sophia prompted me to embrace my own advice and live without worry of others' opinions about my ex-wife's actions. Although the pain lingered, it was time to focus on moving forward and starting a new chapter in my life. Walking my younger daughter down the aisle at her wedding was a moment of pure joy, a significant milestone six years after the divorce. Despite the revelation that my two youngest children were not biologically mine, my bond with all of my children remained strong. William and Sophia's unwavering support and acceptance as their father touched me deeply. They never wavered in their love for me, choosing to maintain our close relationship even after learning the truth about their paternity. They didn't reach out to their biological father, James, and he made no effort to contact them, a situation that suited me just fine. Sophia, who bore the brunt of her mother's infidelity, underwent a challenging journey processing the betrayal and the existence of her half-siblings. I funded counseling sessions for her until she felt she could cope on her own. In contrast, William demonstrated a remarkable resilience, embodying the idea of nurture over nature. Although he doesn't resemble me physically, I see a strong bond between us that transcends genetics. Over time, all three of my children found a sense of peace with Olivia, their mother. For their mental well-being, I refrained from expressing my opinions on her actions, choosing instead to confide in Grace when I needed an outlet. Apart from necessary interactions like the wedding, my communication with Olivia was minimal. While the pain and anger linger, my feelings for her have gradually dimmed. During the wedding, I kept my distance from Olivia, engaging with her only when necessary. Though we stood together for family photos, there was a palpable emotional gap between us that was visible even in the captured moments of joy. After an initial attempt to address the affair upon returning home, Olivia failed to provide a satisfactory explanation or offer a genuine apology. It seems she never intended to come clean about her infidelity, assuming she would never be discovered. The discovery of her betrayal was purely accidental, casting doubt on her true intentions. Even if she dismissed the affair as a fleeting indulgence, the fact that she bore two children with her lover remained a troubling mystery. Months later, during a candid conversation fueled by Tennessee Honey Whiskey, Benjamin confirmed my suspicions about Olivia's sentiments for her lover. Following my firm rejection, she sought solace in Martinez, only to face rejection followed by the revelation of three other mistresses. Even Lily acknowledged that Olivia appeared foolish, manipulated by a wealthy partner. At 51, I harbored doubts about finding another life partner, skeptical of trusting another woman as wholeheartedly as I did Olivia. The lingering shadow of betrayal raises questions about whether remaining ignorant might have been a less painful choice. Real life often lacks the fairy tale endings we desire, characterized by snippets of conversations overheard in airport layovers rather than idyllic images of puppy dogs and rainbows. Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon.